So there are basically, um, there are lots of top points here that we are going through, but we'll have a look at these stages of skill acquisition. So we'll look at the, uh, you know, the, the three different methods, so cognitive, associative and learning, sorry, associative and autonomous. We will then look at the, um, and then there's the characteristics of the learner, for example, you know, how their personality contributes to it, their heredity, if they've got like, for example, you know, some people have, um, like, like, like hereditary, they may have, for example, more slow twitch fibers in comparison to fast twitch fibers. So how that may, um, predetermine them to like a sport or something. Confidence as well, the confidence in approaching the sport. Uh, prior experience, if they've got like, you know, prior experience in a similar sport, they can sort of transmit the, um, transfer that knowledge and finally ability as well so with that you should be able to describe how the characteristics of a learner can influence skill acquisition and performance of skills we've then got the learning environment so the learning environment is um you know we're looking at the nature of the skill itself so the skill um you know what kind of a skill it is we are looking at the performance elements or what does a per an athlete or a sports person need to think um we will we also look at the practice methods so mass distributed whole and part and finally feedback what kind of feedback is most suited so you should be able to do everything on the right hand side so design a suitable plan for teaching beginners to acquire a skill Finally, the assessment of skill and performance. So you need to look at the characteristics of the skilled performer, for example, kinesthetic sense, um, anticipation, consistency, and technique. So how were these things developed now that they are a more experienced um, athlete? Uh, the objective and subjective performance measures. So you want to know examples for this. So, you know, like subjective criteria versus objective criteria, prescribed criteria, personal criteria. Um, validity and reliability of test is something that we will discuss today and personal versus prescribed criteria. So today we are basically going through stage self skill acquisition. We are looking at the nature of a skill um, and practice methods because I think there's a fair bit to remember there and finally we're looking at assessment of skill acquisition so we're looking at the characteristics and also the validity and reliability so I've just marked them for you so these are the um things that we're looking at today but again if you've got questions about what any of the other mean that I've now that I've talked you through them please feel free to send those questions through as well Okay, so there are three stages of skill acquisition and they occur in the following order. Obviously, you start off with cognitive. Now, a cognitive learner is someone who is um, generally learning in a learning phase where they need a coach or a demonstrator to like walk them through what is happening. Um, the movements are, of course, slow and broken down into pieces so that they can pick up and sort of see what is happening. Um, many errors are, of course, made because it's their, you know, their sort of first sort of stage of learning a skill. Um, they need lots of feedback to correct their technique, but at the same time, you know, that feedback should be both positive and negative. Um, there is lots of thinking required to execute because, you know, the mechanical actions, for example, may still be very new to them. So they need to sort of think through um, everything a fair bit before they can go ahead. Um, only the very beginning of practicing the skill, do you have this are you in the stage like at the very beginning maybe the first couple of lessons the first couple of weeks where you're sort of in the stage where you're still learning this um the skill finally you need encouragement by coaches by um yeah by coaches uh in order to you know progress to the next level and to still feel motivated to progress to the next level the associative learning stage is the practice phase where you are a bit more fluent you're making less errors um your mistakes are more self-recognized like you can fight like you find yourself making some mistakes and you try to fix them um and you start to develop what, what we call a kinesthetic sense a kinesthetic sense is when you're starting to gain that muscle memory and that feel um for a specific movement and you know you start to feel what's wrong versus what feels right for example if you're a bowler you know in your bowling you start to feel that you know for example your hand may be moving not in the way that you want it to when you sort of let go of the ball um or, or when you you know when you're doing a rotate when you're sort of bringing your arm around to sort of um deliver you know you may find that your hand's moving in a certain way or your wrist may not be twisting the way you want it to to i don't know like do you like a um, full toss or something? So you sort of start to feel 
what's wrong versus what's right. Um, and some tend to remain in the stage forever. And this could be because, you know, they may not continue on after that. Or they may not sort of, you know, play at the highest level. So they sort of remain in this associative stage. We then get to the autonomous stage of uh, skill acquisition. So the autonomous stage of uh, skill acquisition is when our movements are more automatic, right? They're more fluent. An athlete is able to, you know, uh, in order to, uh, an athlete is able to execute a skill with very few errors, um, and they have sort of transitioned from that stage of being a learner to being an expert in that specific area, um, and they can also focus on other areas of the game. So now it's not just about like the technique, but it's also about anticipating what the opposition is going to do. It's also about um, calculating the tactics of the game. It is also easier to adapt to different environments. So you know, once for example, if you've got a uh, um, for example, example a bowler in cricket and they are a skilled uh, you know they are sort of world class uh, they're at that obviously at the autonomous stage of skill acquisition they know what they're doing they will be able to sort of bowl um and you know maybe change their bowling technique depending on the type of pitch that they're playing on um or if you've got a batter um who is very experienced they will be able to adapt to the conditions um for example if the pitch is behaving in a certain way they may not you know they may just play defense or they may play attack depending on what's happening and that is um a quality of an autonomous learner who has rich, uh, who has um you know reached that level where they're able to sort of discern um and adapt to different situations so the nature of a skill um, the nature of a skill basically refers to um, the elements of a skill or oh, sorry the elements of a skill so if it's so there are four classifications for it firstly is a discrete serial or continuous so if a, so if a skill is discrete that means it has a clear beginning and a clear end and that for example shooting a ball in basketball you know you start, you hold it, you, uh, you know, you may be dribbling it, you hold it, you shoot it. That's a clear beginning and a clear end. Serial combines a number of discrete. So that could be a layup in basketball. So we're doing like each thing individually, but it's a number of, you know, the discrete movements. Finally, continuous is a rapid skill so that can include dribbling in basketball it's um it's, sorry it's not a rapid it's a repetitive skill so continuously dribbling in basketball so basket so dribbling in basketball is a continuous skill in comparison to a layup which is a serial skill so those are the three categories there then we've got open versus closed so open is when uh, if a skill is open that means it's always changing according to the environment according to weather according to the opponents for example a tennis serve no tennis serve will be the same it's going to be different it's going to change um you know with every serve closed on the other hand is when it's controlled and stable for example bowling in a 10 pin bowling um it's stable it's controlled the area remains the same the the you know there's nothing nothing's going to come out of somewhere the the position of the you know the yeah the position of the the balls is not going to change so every time it's different um so every time it's the same it's not different and then we've got gross versus fine skin a gross skill is a skill that requires large muscle groups for example long jump we're using a lot of um the muscle groups to sort of power the movement um in comparison to a fine skill which is skills that are using isolated muscle groups so think of your fine motor skills those are generally the ones that use that you know are fine skills and they can be easier to learn as well for example shooting obviously you know to get to a point where you can do it really well is a different thing but you know it's something that still doesn't that you'd probably be able to do um faster than like learning a layup in basketball so with something like this you know it's requiring isolated muscle groups same thing well kind of the same thing with like archery shooting um yeah and then finally we've got self-paced versus externally paced so self-paced um if a skill is self-paced that means the timing and speed are determined by the performer for example a tennis serve the performer 
the, uh, the athlete, you know, the tennis player decides where they're going to serve it, when they're going to serve it. Um, so it's self-paced. They, they're they in control. Same thing with the bowler, you know, it's self-paced. They decide how they're going to run, when they're going to run, what position they're going to run up to. However, if a skill is externally paced, it means the time and the speed are determined by an external force. And that could just be, you know, like re uh, someone, the player who's returning a serve, um, a returning serve in basketball, uh, not basketball, in tennis, where the way in which they return and the position and the timing is all dependent on the initial serve. Um, a batter, right? So a batter, the way in which they hit the ball, where they hit the ball, when they hit it, um, is all going to be dependent on the bowler. So that is, you know, like contrasting examples. So now let's have a look at the different practice methods. So there are essentially um, four types here that we're looking at. So firstly, an entire training session. Um, so we're breaking down into the training session and the skill. So a training session can be massed, which means the lesson can be lengthy with very little breaks. Um, and that is beneficial for skills that are used frequently. So you're continuously repeating the same thing with no breaks. Um, or it can be distributed, which means that there are shorter periods of practice with breaks. And that can be important for, um, and you know, that can be beneficial for learning complex skills that have a lot of movements involved. And especially if you've got cognitive learners, like if you just have a person who hasn't, like who's not very good at dribbling, never done it before, not very good at it at all, and you tell them to stand there and dribble for 30 minutes straight, they are more than likely not going to be able to do it. And after the time, you know, your concentration as a cognitive learner, your concentration tends to uh, fall to two. It is not easy to, like, for example, dribble three balls, right? So it will um, it will falter. And so as a result, generally, mass practice is beneficial for learning a skill that is um, more... A skill that is used frequently, that is repeated frequently, and you would probably do this with like a with like an um, associative learner in comparison to distributed, which is generally more beneficial for um, a skill that is complex and for a learner um, who is in a cognitive stage of skill acquisition. And then the skill can be part or whole. So if a skill is part. Um, and that means that the skill, the serial skills, are broken into parts, discrete. So if you've got a serial skill, uh, as you can see here, which combines a number of discrete um, movements, it's broken down into parts and into like individual discrete movements, and those are practiced in isolation. So for example, shooting in. Uh, so for example, if you're learning a layup, you're firstly practicing shooting and then practicing uh, dribbling and then bringing the two together and doing it together. So something like that would, again, work very nicely for a cognitive learner who's still trying to, um, who, who is still trying to sort of put everything together. Finally, whole. So skill practice, um, whole, uh, when we practice skill whole, as the name suggests, we're practicing the entire thing. And it is generally used for associative and autonomous learners, not cognitive learners, because they are still learning the skill. They are still in that initial stage, but rather for associative and autonomous learners um, in order to start building a kinesthetic sense. If you're doing the same thing over and over again and you know how to do it, and you know, you may be, for example, yeah, doing it, um, maybe doing it in different like circumstances or conditions you start to build a kinesthetic sense it starts to feel more normal and um that again can include a basketball layup you do the whole thing and you're not breaking it down into shooting practice and dribbling practice so let's have a look at the characteristics so assessment of a skill looking at the characteristics so we firstly got kinesthetic sense so kinesthetic sense um if a player has a kinesthetic sense, firstly, they are generally um, an autonomous, like at, at the autonomous level of skill acquisition, because kinesthetic sense, even though it starts to develop at the associative stage, um, if you know you get to that stage, uh, you get to having kinesthetic sense um, as generally as an autonomous learner, and it refers to the proprioception of performance in 
so this is when they you know they are in tune with their muscle movements they can feel the error they can feel okay this is not quite as right this is um better and errors can be corrected as they're occurring so if i'm for example i'm a bowler and i'm feeling okay you know the way i've just held my ball in the run up and i'm holding it i'm running it doesn't feel right so when i should deliver it i need to not do it the same way i don't need to for example move my wrist as i usually do i'm going to um not move as much i'm just going to focus more on uh the you know letting go of it um something like that where it's more you know you're making adjustments while the movement is occurring because you have a sense of what your body is doing so for example a surfer making small adjustment to their movements while surfing in accordance to the prevailing conditions um such in such as waves and wind anticipation so this is referring to the ability to read the play um as again as an autonomous player generally they're able to read the play they're able to read what is happening you know which which for example um which opponents they have to look out for um or what the technique of the opposing technique uh, of the opposing team may be and through that they can anticipate what may happen before it occurs and prepare for it and this is again a strong quality of an autonomous learner um, so an example can include a skilled goalkeeper, for example, right? So we've all um, probably heard about the 20, uh, we've all heard about the World Cup, right? The 2022, yeah, 2022, right? Oh, I, I'm, I'm still sort of trying to figure out what year it is. Yeah, 2022, that's right. Um, World Cup. And so, you know, when we've got something like that, we've got a skilled goalkeeper who's able to anticipate in a penalty kick. Like, you would have watched the last um, penalty kick, France versus uh, Argentina. Um, and just that, and you can see it in their faces where, you know, you've got the goalies who are able to sort of, who are, like, so focused on the, um, on the, on the, on the guy or the person who's kicking and as a result they're able to sort of see and you know see by the foot placement by the initial sort of um <clears throat> movement how they will and eye contact too how uh, where they'll um kick so this of course allows them more time to prepare and also think about how far to jump and die <clears throat> next we have assessments of skills so characteristics so this is when we are looking firstly at the technique so skilled athletes have good technique right otherwise they won't be skilled athletes um when they're executing a skill which of course will save them energy and allow them to focus on other aspects of the sport so for instance we've got an elite gymnast with correct technique um is better is able to better able uh, is better able to focus under pressure and execute routine seamlessly so they're able to deal with the pressure because they know that um you know they have they they have the right technique they have the kinesthetic sense for it so they'll they'll be fine um similarly we've got consistency so this is the repetition of good performers and so the repetition of good performance and execution so skilled performer is um consistently succeeding because they're able to replicate that um performance and technique every time so an example could be a skilled diver being able to execute a black uh, a backflip sequence correctly every time that they have a go at it so let's now have a look at the last big dot for uh, the last dot point for um the stages of learning which is validity and reliability of tests so we are testing athletes you know they conduct they are uh, doing different tests but when we do this um we need to consider the validity and reliability of tests because um they're important in assessing performance um as they use to check performance and track any improvements so we need to have tests that are valid which means a valid test will test um a valid test will measure or test what it is supposed to measure so or so for example if you've got if you want to test a player's speed you won't have them run a 10 kilometer run because that is testing endurance that is not testing their speed but instead you must you might time them doing a 100 meter sprint which is more about speed and how fast they can really go Similarly, reliability refers to the consistency of a test. So this is where we're controlling variables. So everything stays the same and each time you should be able to produce the same sort of test result. Um, yeah, each time produce the same test result. So for example, if you're doing a sit and reach test um, and you're doing it on the same box every time, um, 
you know, a similar result should be achieved. And if it is, then we know that the test is reliable. And I've got a um, schematic there for us to sort of visualize what is happening. If you this first bit over here, you can see that this is unreliable. You're in uh, that is unreliable and unvalid. It's unreliable because it's not testing what it's supposed to test. Um, but let me see if I can change the color. Okay, yes, I can. Give me one sec. Okay, so that you can actually see. So, it's this is where we've got, for example, if you can see that green dot, that, if the um, the dots were there, then you could see that that would be, um, that would be reliable. Uh, that would be valid because it's supposed to sort of, you know, like, get to the center. Um, but it's not getting to the center and it's unreliable. It is unreliable because the results are scattered everywhere. That is why it's unreliable. However, in the second one, it is unreliable but valid because it is getting close to the scent. Like it's, you know, it's not just at what it's not concentrated at one place, but it's getting around the um, the board. So we're getting close. You know, we've got some here. Um, so it's getting close, which means it's valid, but it's not reliable because the results are not concentrated everywhere. Then we look at this one. We can clearly tell that this is not valid because it's not anywhere supposed to what we're supposed to measure. You know, it's not a, in that vicinity. However, all the results are concentrated in one spot. And that tells us that this is valid. Last but not the least, we've got a test that is both reliable and valid. I am getting my results close to where they need to be. They are hitting the spot every time. And all my results are similar every time. And that tells me that my test is both reliable and it is both valid. This is something you would come across if you're doing like uh, biology too. Like validity and reliability are very important concepts in general. Okay.